Welcome to Game Changers today, and we have a very special gentleman uh, at his own premises in Paliagoda, the chairman of Dilma, Mr. Meryl J. Fernando himself. We managed to drag him away a little bit from his very important corporate day and sit him down. I know it's a difficult story <laughs> for him, but sir, thank you very much for taking the time to meet with us on it's Game Changers. It's my pleasure to be on your program. Thank you. It's uh, a very special place as well. I've just been watching the, 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 the history on the wall. is un un unbelievable. Your humble beginnings in Nigambo and, and as a schoolboy, tell us a little bit about that. Well, yes, I was born in Kuchikade. I used to walk to the Kuchikade railway station about a mile, morning and evening, to go to school at Maristella. Then from the Nigambo station, the train journey only took seven minutes. From the Nigambo station to Maristella College, I walked another mile up and down. And I was young those days and I enjoyed uh, the schooling and the life in the village. And uh, we used to go to church every Sunday morning with my parents. And uh, the village life was really enjoyable and I miss it now because we used to wake up maybe at 5.30 in the morning and we are fast asleep at 7 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> that is the village life, healthy, strong life. And tied to the sunlight as well, of yes, course. Yes, yes, yes. And also the village, I remember, the fishermen used to come to the house, vegetables, and every Sunday we had delicious pork curry. They killed pigs all around from Vindapu up to maybe about Vattala. It was a specialist. Yes, yes, yes. A Sunday meal, the pork curry was famous. Nigam pork curry was famous. So from those humble beginnings, any ambitions at that time as to what you were going to do after school, once you moved across? I, I intended becoming a lawyer. And uh, Was that a family ambition or was that your...? No, it was my own okay. ambition. And I thought this is what I want to do. But however, fate decided otherwise. As fate always does. Yes, yes, yes. It's not unusual. So to Colombo and to St. Joseph's and, yes. and another start at, an, at a new school. Yes. Also by the water. Yes. And exactly. how, how did that go? Very good, very good. I enjoyed my life there, the teachers, and I still remember both my life in uh, Marshall College, Nigambo, and at St. Joseph's. We have many friends. And uh, soon after I finished my secondary education, I got through the SSC those days. Matriculation exam was replaced by the senior school certificate. I passed out, getting ready to go to law college. And uh, then the opportunity came when the British firms recruited six Sri Lankans to the tea trade for the first time. Until then... Uh, it was an expatriate they, story. Yes, only expatriates. They said that Sri Lankans can't taste tea because you ate too much hot curry. <laughs> That was an excuse. To that was the reason given. The official reason. <laughs> official reason. <laughs> they, they, yeah, that's right. But the reason truly behind it is that uh, they want to ensure that their work permits were renewed. And uh, I was one of the first batches to get into that. And uh, at that, that time, I had, during my school holidays, I used to go to my friend's estates in uh, Pundloya. And I began to see how diligently those workers on plantations worked. And how organized and how, yeah. hard, how much hard work goes yes, into it. Yes, yes, very hard work. And so diligent about their work. They feed their children, come to back at lunchtime, come and work again. And they were examples of solid work. But well, it's they, pretty much meticulous when yeah, you think about it. Absolutely, in every way. But mind you, <laughs> that was in the... 40s and 50s. Today, <laughs> workers on plantations are different. <laughs> very different. Very different, very different. So, of cost of production is very high. But I re began to like tea, the plantation life in, in the, on the estates, fresh air, nice people, and uh, good life, generally, healthy life. And uh, when I got into the trade as a tea taster, I had the opportunity to see the other, other end, what happens to our tea. So that the, changed the my whole life. The productive side of that. Mm, the other side of it. 
that which changed my whole life. And I am here today because of that inspiration I got to change, to attempt to change the culture, the colonial culture that prevails even 70 years after independence. So in a way, your relationship with tea began from a holiday on a, on a tea estate? From about 12 years of age. So you started going on holiday and yes. you started to have a more yes. affinity for the tea and then exactly. the way of life. And yes, yes. It's a remarkable journey in every sense of the word. It's a long, long journey. And uh, I have been very fortunate in getting the vision I had, I had for Ceylon tea. And uh, I, am, I seem to be the only man today who is demonstrating and displaying my confidence and trust in Ceylon tea. I think... At a difficult time, sir. Yes, yes. And everybody wants to make a difference to tea. Why? The tea trade globally is in the hands of traders. Traders who buy as cheap as possible, squeezing the producer, whether it is tea, coffee, chocolate or vegetables, squeeze the person to the extent that they can hardly live in the prices they get for their crop. And this lie to consumers and bring huge personalities, celebrities to promote their product. Some of those celebrities who say, I drink only so-and-so brand of tea, don't drink tea at all. I have no idea. I have no idea. But consumers, they, oh, if she's drinking that big celebrity, we want to drink it. They are traders, so they have no affinity or loyalty or love or concern for the poor farmers. Don't care at America. all. They don't care at all. Or the consumer. They squeeze both sides. So their traders' only ambition and their only goal is profit. How they make it is nobody's concern. The difference between all other brands in the world and my brand, Dilma, is that we are growers, we are farmers, we grow tea, we see how, what a difficult life. You work with the soil and you yes, see and it grow. Then, yeah, and then the, my heart and soul is in the tea industry. I love tea. I can today not fight with all the other, all traders in the industry to keep Ceylon tea clean and not to import cheap tea to, for them to benefit. I'm the, well, now there are big exporters who are joining me so we can to fight the cause of Ceylon tea. But the traders, that is the difference. They don't care what happened to the industry. As a farmer taking our tea, we survive. There are others also who do the same thing. We survive on the industry, on the, our plantations, on the image and the quality of Ceylon tea. And it is being successful. And I can give you why I started my own brand. I can, it's a long story, but if I tell you in short, when I was familiar with the plantations and I loved that life and I loved tea. So I thank God when I was selected among the first batches of tea tasters into the tea trade. Quite an inspiration as well to be able to get yeah. that chance. Yes, yes, yes. And then I forgot the law and got into the, <laughs> as a tea taster, I trained under a very fine gentleman, a British gentleman called Mr. O.P. Rust. And I picked up the basics of tea tasting. Then I grew up from there. I went to London to see the branding, marketing end of it. What I saw in London, changed my whole life and attitude to our colonial master at the time, who I believed were great, honest, honorable people. But what they did in Mincing Lane is to mix our Ceylon tea with various other cheaper teas and market and brand them with their own brands, which are today's big brands in the world. and market them as Ceylon tea, put in their packets saying Ceylon tea. 
So using our name, using promoting our name. themselves. Yes, because Ceylon tea, thanks to the British again, acquired a famous, a unique name for quality in the world. You go to any part of the world and ask them, where does the best tea come from? Some will say from England. Many others will say Ceylon. So, of course, coming from England is quite mistakenly. <laughs> yes, because, you know, British made, the, made tea famous. They imported all our tea, our tea, Indian tea, uh, African tea, all those to London, blended, packaged, mixed, did all the harmful things to Ceylon tea and marketed it throughout the world. This is in the, up to about early 80s, mid 75s. They exported to USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and all of the, all of Europe. Under the banner, good English yes, tea. Yes, 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 that's true. And that is why London became the center, center. of the tea world. Mind you, nine, ten thousand miles away from the place of action where tea is grown, the trading center and Ceylon tea center was in the big city of London. That is the power of the colonial masters at the time. So London became a hub. It yes, was yes, a tea exchange yes, of the yes, world. Yes, yes, that, that's, that's, it. that's the place you talk about tea, talk about London. Then slowly it changed. And when I saw what is happening there, I realized, my goodness, what is going to happen to our tea in 10, 20 years time? So was that the moment you thought, I need yeah. to be the change? Yes, that is. And I began to feel this is going to destroy our industry. And people were cashing in on the consumer image of Ceylon tea, the quality of Ceylon tea. Because as I said, British marketed Ceylon tea very well. Historically. Yes. And consumers believe that every good tea is Ceylon tea. So I thought, my goodness, what is going to happen to our tea? in 10, 20 years time and it just occurred to me how nice it would be if I have my own brand of tea which will be the finest tea on earth and I will share my earnings with the poor plantation workers and the needy and share with the community. Next morning I realized I was dreaming <laughs> and <laughs> It was that was a, a good dream, though. Yeah, yeah, that was, was a worthy dream. Yes, that's right. And it was an impossible dream. When I came back to Sri Lanka at the time, I was, I was only 24 years of age at that time when I got this thought of having my own brand someday. Although I knew it was impossible, that a small friar from coming from humble beginnings can compete in the big world of tea. But well, you I, didn't give up on that. You but, didn't, you but you know, give. something kept haunting me and inspiring me. 34 years later, <laughs> I launched Dilbati. But what I did was, but 34 years later, tea had come down in quality and Ceylon tea had disappeared from all then famous multinational brands. The world had changed. Yes. In the case of tea, the brand owners changed the world of tea to suit their bottom lines. The compromise. Yes. And the consumers had the perception that Ceylon tea is the finest in the world. And he had, they were these same brands sold as Ceylon tea. And today, or around maybe 25 years ago, they switched to tea. There were several small family companies in England, about 350 of them in England, about 15, 20 in New Zealand, about 15, 20 in Australia. These big today's multinationals came and acquired every one of those firms or most of those firms. And I used to ask them, I used to supply them bulk tea from Ceylon. And I used to ask them, why do you sell your company? You as third generation, fourth generation. They used to tell me, well, my turnover is $3 million, but they offered me $5 million. 
to survive better. Yeah, because on the three million turnover, they would have made maybe hundred thousand dollars. Here, when they offer outright five million dollars, said we can't refuse it. So I used to tell them, you know, this is your legacy. So they say we can't complete. Some of the companies refused to sell, and this we were told. But soon they went out of business because the, when the big traders took over the companies, they forgot about quality. They all the packs which previously said Ceylon tea became so and so's brand names tea. I can tell you some names, whether it is Lipton's tea, Tilkley tea, or Twining's tea. It became, it, it was previously Ceylon tea, and it became tea. So tea gives you the license to put any tea. Especially today, where retailers want to discount and discount, they discount, accept those discount gladly. Because they drop the quality if they want 30% discount, so they, they drop the quality 40%. Because they are selling tea, not by origin. At some years ago, until about, I would say about 30 years ago, Ceylon tea was sold by region. I, I promoted some myself because we would say no really a tea, the tea, uh, gold tea, low country. Mid country tea, Kutmali, Nawalpiti, all those areas. Point of origin. Point of origin and regional tea also. So we were selling tea like wine of today. At that time, they only get red wine, now white wine or rose. Now we have got Chateau bottle wine and all. Everything. And every single estate is producing this. On that note, so I need to say we need to have a quick break on Game Changers. We're talking with Meryl J. Fernando, the visionary. The name Dilma is now a global brand and he's just telling us in his own words his path from his beginnings in Nigambo through school to what has become now an incredible Sri Lankan story. Welcome back to Game Changers. We are in conversation with Mr. Meryl J. Fernando at his own premises here in Paliagoda, the Duma factory. And his thoughts about the path, the history, and the whole global industry that is now a very Sri Lankan story in, in, in effect. I need to now just check with him about his vision that stood him apart from everybody else and how that carried forth. Mr. Fernando, thank you very much again. My you're pleasure. telling us. You're telling us more about that pathway and how business is controlled and how the big conglomerates have taken over. But you've stood your ground. Your vision has come forth and, and trailblazed in every sense of the word. Tell us about that. In a very small way. <laughs> well, when I decided to launch my own brand, 34 years after my dream, I knew I had to produce a tea that nobody else can replicate. So I started off finding a name for my tea. And I decided to name it after my two children. The two boys. My two boys. Dilma, coined from the names of Dilhan and Malik. Then I had to find a celebrity to promote the brand. But I didn't have money to pay a celebrity. Reality. Yes. So I thought my Friends advised me, saying that you know tea so well, why don't you get up and say this is your own brand? I said it took me a little time. I said okay. So I put my face on every pack as a guarantee that this of what I was saying is inside the pack. Well, pretty much because it's your own produce. Your own produce. You're the farmer. Or exactly. And the face on the back. Exactly. The two greatest assets in for the success of Dilma tea brand was the integrity of the tea, named after my children, my face on the pack. A family story. Family story. And consumers around the world wrote to me saying, 
you have named the brand after your sons, and I used to say that's my third son, Dilma. Mm. And you put your face on it, and you have a great product. Even to this date, I get this from all over the world, consumers saying, describing the tea and, and our values. And I went, so I thought I'm now equipped with a real brand name and a living face. So I thought, now, what are the other unique things I can do? For the first time, I broke the colonial mode of the colonies supplying raw material for value addition at the other end, Make, leaving our producers and their workers hungry. And separate. Yes. And in lying rooms, suffering, while their sweat, toil and tears created millionaires and billion, billionaires outside in many foreign countries. So I thought, I want to reverse that trend. See, I was quite young at this day, so I had these mad ideas. So I thought, I must do all the packing here, under my roof, instead of getting other people, getting laborers and contract packers. So I bought, with the little money I had saved up selling bulk tea, I was previously selling bulk tea. I was the fourth, fourth largest exporter in the year 1976, competing with all the big companies. As an individual, I was able to build up the bulk tea trade to that extent, to be the fourth largest exporter of bulk tea is a big achievement. But At the time, it was huge. At, at the, yes. <laughs> and it was. And then, I thought I bought two machines, tea bagging machines. I built a little factory just outside. My first factory is in the same premises, okay. wardroom. Put in there and started packing all the tea in-house. And at that time, I bought my first tea estate, Milton Estate, which was nationalized by government on the Land Reform Act. And when I bought that tea, uh, that estate, its prices were about about one one rupee fifty cents, two rupees, and the yield was about four hundred and fifty kilos. I brought it. I bought the estate from a British family. Uh, four years later, I invested a lot of money. The yield came up to eight hundred pounds per acre, and the price, I remember we got the highest price in the Dimbul district of 3 rupees and 85 cents. And in less than six months later, it was nationalized and fell into pieces. So it broke my heart, but I knew this is what you have we are in for in a, in a socialist government with unwanted socialism in this country. Then I had a fleet of small fleet of six vehicle trucks to take my tea to the port and collect teas. I got a notice that they were going to be nationalized. So I had Mr. Maitri Palasena who was a minister of transport at the time, I went to him and told him he stopped that. But those events broke my heart. So the heartbreaking story, did it make you more no, made me more committed to continue my mission. So you wanted to fight on, yes, you wanted to give I, up. Yes, I wanted to fight on and I thought my interests were solely concentrated on tea and the tea industry, not only in making money. So when I went to, I selected Australia as my first market because I was a large supplier of tea in bulk to Australia. I knew many, many, many packers there. So. When I decided to launch my own brand, I told the government, well, I'm going to do it. The whole trade in this country, without exception, ridiculed me and insulted me, saying various reasons. And they went to the government and told them, don't let man do this man they do this. They tried to stop it. Tried to stop it. Why? Because most of the big Noises in the tea trees at that time 
were suppliers of tea to multinational companies or international traders or national brands. And those people brought pressure on these chaps, our boys, to discourage me from, from value adding here in our own country. For consumers, the best marketing story is to say, grown and packaged in Sri Lanka, guarantee of pure Ceylon tea. You can't break those, those images and those words. That is the truth. So I had so much resistance and I was ridiculed. They put news clips in the papers ridiculing me what I'm trying to do. But they didn't discourage me. Yeah, some, some spirit kept urging me. And finally I realized Dilma tea is grown, packaged, all the benefits of packaging remain in the country. When I take Dilma tea to the to foreign market, I could just say this is my tea, named after my children, carrying my guarantee with my face on my own packet. And it was then the only ethically produced tea in the world. Sadly, it is still the only ethically produced tea. Now, there are people who get fair trade marks. There is nothing fair about trade. Trade, trade is exploitation. How can you make it fair? By getting a marketing gimmick of a big international company, huge business, this fair trade company, you pay them a fee and get the fair trade. Get the okay. seal of approval. Sort of exactly. So, that consumers get confused and pay extra money for that. If you remember, if you know the number of letters I have got, one in particular I remember in Australia, about 15 people signed a letter and sent me, your tea is a great brand. You share your profit with the poor and so forth. And you are a fair trade. Please get the fair trade label and increase your price. You see, the perception is when you put a fair, a fair trade label, you can increase, you can increase the, price. the price. So I wrote back to them and said, mine is not fair trade. Mine is the fairest form of trade. It is ethical produced tea. I don't want any commercial uh, marketing strategy to support my brand. It will undermine my brand. I won't. Then they said, if you don't get the fair trade, very sadly, we will have to give up drinking tea. I said, the choice is yours. This is my story. So I don't know whether we stayed with the brand or not. Then, ultimately, when I went to the uh, press in Australia, there were about eight, ten people, and I told them, tea has become a commodity. Previously, it was sold by origin, and the consumers would then have an opportunity to say, I want Ceylon tea, and Nourilia tea, Dimula tea, Dikoya tea, Logron tea, whatever it is. Or they could buy Assam tea, Tarjanic tea, and they had a choice. Now, tea became a commodity, just the ordinary cheap commodity. So they didn't know where it came from? No. And you know that those big multinationals have so much clout with governments that governments until about maybe 15, less than 20 years ago, every food and beverage that was imported into countries had to declare the country of origin. That, in the case of tea, was a consumer's only guarantee of quality. If they said Ceylon tea, they know it's good quality. They knew. Yes. If they say African tea, they won't buy it. But they managed the governments to persuade them to delete that. So the consumer lost again his or her choice to pick the tea again. Uh, again. So consumer becomes victim to multinational traders or other international traders requirements to enhance their bottom line. So I told them, I am going to bring integrity back to tea. 
and I'm bring the values to, back. Yes. And then bring you the finest tea on it. And I will share my earnings with my workers, the poor, and the wider community. So the press, as I was a small player in the field, they sympathized with me, but they said, why don't these big boys, the big traders do that, if you can do? So I told them, big traders have no interest in the producing country or in the consumers. Their interest is only concentrated on money. How that money is made, they don't care. It's all economics. Exactly, exactly. And I don't blame the CEO, CEOs of those companies because shareholders are big institutions. They demand higher and higher profits, 10 to 15 percent increase per year. If they don't find that, if they don't get the additional dividends to the shareholders, they lose their job. So, you know, the, the, the CEOs are also caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. It is a catch-22 situation. That's right. So, I told them, I'll declare the integrity of my tea by having on each pack single origin tea. That is the integrity of the tea. It's not mixed, but single origin. Original, homegrown. Homegrown. The quality, I'll give you the finest tea on it was said by 100% pure Ceylon tea, which is on every packet of black tea. Then I said, <coughs> I said, I declare grown and packaged in Sri Lanka, ethically produced. That is my guarantee of sharing, of retaining all the profits that are taken away from our country now and enriching traders around the world. Around the world will remain here and enrich my country, Sri Lanka, and give the farmers a better break. Then the press didn't ridicule me, but they said, right, you are an ambitious young man, we wish you well, but you are going to have a hard time for the trade. So when I launched my product, Lipton, uh, the, the Unilever had a brand, local brand, which was the biggest seller there. And their price was one, one dollar ninety nine cents for a hundred tea bags at that time. So I priced my tea at two dollars nineteen cents. So the retailer said, "You can't, you can't do this. You can't do this. You Not have possible. To, you have to respect the, the." market leader, you had to sell below. I said, if I sell below, I lose money. I won't survive. Yeah, I won't survive. So he said, oh, you somehow do this for a while. So I priced my tea at 189. And uh, I thought, well, I am now on to a good thing. The competitors brought their price down on special promotions to 149. So I knew this the tea was, was the end hand. of my journey. So I went to see the buyer at Coles. I told him, what, what do I do now? Thank you for listening to my story and supporting me now. What do I do? He said, Meryl, I have good news for you. He said, the number of phone calls and letters we have got from our customers is unbelievable. About the quality of your All tea. those things say, thank you for bringing Ceylon tea back. So my point is, consumers are forced, are driven to eat and drink what the traders consider the best for their bottom line. They have no regard at all for the producer or for the consumer. Their only concern is money and profit. Business. Yes, so this is the world we live in. And then the brand, those, when they said, Coles, thank you for bringing Ceylon tea back. Those were the sweetest words I ever heard in my life. And from then on, that brand has not looked back. And within the year, I had profits. I made good profits. Then I thought, 
I had a staff then only of 18 and a few factory workers. And I told them, I want. Then at that point, the crucial thing is when you start, when an entrepreneur starts something, he will fail or succeed. When you succeed, you will see money flowing. At that stage, you face crossroads. Am I going to become a big rich man? Or stay the same size? Or stay stronger? Stronger and share my success with the workers and with the community if it is possible. A brilliant thought, Mr. Professor Fernando. On that note, we're going to take another break on Game Changers. His vision, his strength to stay original has been part of his life, his entire life based on quality and still on tea. When we come back, how he broke into the big markets around the world and how he captured the heart of Russia. Welcome back to Game Changers here on Art TV, and we are talking with Mr. Merrill J. Fernando about his vision, his path, the constant battles he's had over the years uh, to build a global brand of Dilma and then of course Ceylon Tea. In more ways than one, it has been his life and history, but as he will tell you now, it's not been an ideal path, but it's been his persistence to stay with that dream and his vision that has made the difference. Mr. Fernando, thank you again very much for being with us. It's my pleasure. You were talking about the business side of things and then the originality of your brand and how you managed to convince a global market in, in, yes. in effect, starting with Australia. But tell us more about the, how Russia became such a big part of our little brand yes. here that yes. you built. Now I started with the, the, the sharing of the profits. Can I finish that and come to Russia? So I had only... <coughs> 18 employees then. So I didn't. The fear. cottage industry, in effect, the small uh, cottage yes, industry. Tiny little one, yes, yes, right. And uh, uh, I thought the most I would have maybe 25, 30 employees. So when I started, and I told the staff, I want to help you, I want to give some benefits to your family. So I gave every one of their children all the uh, school books, stationery, clothes, shoes necessary for them to go to school. Turn the kids out. Yes, exactly. And I made sure they are well kitted out. And I also offered scholarships for people who did, they were against some certain O levels and A levels. And at the time, I knew I could keep funding up to 25, 30 people at that stage. That was when I realized that when I came to the crossroads, I took the path to care and share, and share, which brought to my, my memory that my mother taught me that when I was from four or five years of age, when he used to get my sweets and chocolates, take half of it and give it to the neighbor's children. I used to cry. He said, no, no, son. So I used to talk to her, why I gave my sweets away? You know, who is poor children. So at that time, I, and I, I, I was very upset with her for giving my things away. But when I started making a little money, that thought came back to me, what my mother showed me, what she did. And I have grown my foundation exactly on that. So at that stage, I started helping my staff. So on that so, thought was the Merrill J Foundation? Yes, subsequently, I started in 1962, this charity. And today, I have in this building, 1,400 workers, all their children get... In fact, today was an event which I handed a token to 12 cheap people, big parcels of textbook and not the clothes, clothes are given secondly. And today, I have 1,400 here, plantations, I have several thousand. Every one of their children gets the same thing again. 
So I have been blessed with growing increased income to meet all those. And today, you'll find it difficult to believe that on our plantations, typical children are doctors, lawyers, engineers, Qualified. and other professionals through the scholarships of the foundation. Unbelievable. Now that is that gives me so much happiness and satisfaction that I started selling tea. And I have been blessed in numerous ways. Now you talked about the Russian business. When the Russian embassy was established in Sri Lanka in 1958, I was introduced to the Russian ambassador, Mr. Yakolev. And he told me we want to buy tea from Sri Lanka. And you, we want you to help us. He said, how can I help you? We want you to set up a laboratory. So they had a, a house in Thurston Road. I went there and set up a tasting room and cups and all to give them all the help. Quality control. Yes, absolutely. Tasting all that. So they gave me the monopoly of supplying bulk tea to Russia. Wonderful opportunity. Yes, great opportunity. Then about, then after some years, one or two others also shared their business. But my greatest break in life was at that time, Russian government in 1988 gave me the sole monopoly of packaged tea, Dilma tea, for about 1988. 98, for about 12 years, I had the monopoly when I shipped hundreds of 40 foot containers to Russia month after month. And I don't know how that was possible. Every home, every in Russia, the USSR then has tasted Dilmati. And <coughs> until the ruble crashed. We had a very large share of the Russian business. Goodness, I'm trying to think of uh, who else would have had that sort of pathway. I, I don't know what, how this happened, but I always say I give thanks to the good Lord Jesus Christ for guiding my life and blessing me in many, many ways. So the Russian strength, our position weakened after the ruble crisis and now they are in with the sanctions and, and the they, they don't bigger. have all this. But if the if all those sanctions are lifted, Russia is a great country, very powerful country, really huge resources. If the sanctions are lifted, the ruble will appreciate. They can start, start again. Ilmati again. Now we still ship, but nothing like we shipped at that stage. Not at the boon time. Yes, that's right. So my that's right. then I started the, the charitable aspect of my life based on my mother's practices, continued, and in 2002, I incorporated Mary J. Fernando Charitable Foundation. Now that, I have several companies in the group now, and I'm happy to say that although my Milton estate was nationalized, taken over, I vowed that day that I will someday have another estate. I'm happy to say today we have several, several estates. Wonderful. And then I have concentrated my efforts on tea. And we have got estates, but the plantation ministry's uh, inspection, assessment of the uh, RP regional plantation companies, gave Kahwata plantation, which we own, as a number one RPC. We have investment in brokering, and we own Forbes and Walker. And in exports, we have a very strong brand, Dil Dilmati, which is earning the highest foreign exchange for the country, for, a pack, for tea. So therefore, the three segments of the tea industry I have concentrated my efforts. You consolidated your efforts yes. as well. And then I can say that Dilma is the only company in the world which has vertically, vertical integration 
in the tea industry and owning a global brand to carry our crop tea crop to the world. So these are things I only have to say thank the, thank the good Lord for. Comparing, looking at my humble beginnings, my humble beginnings, I don't know how, how I came to this position. Well, when you consider all of the uh, origin and the start and, and the pathway and the persistence, not giving up, there has to be an inherent Merrill J strength yeah, I never that give up. did not let you <laughs> stay away from it. No. You didn't give up. No, I didn't. Neither did you back down. Yes. You still fought all yeah. the way. And yes, here you are today, I, persisting again. Yes, I never give up. You know, I battle for small things. My children tell me, Tati, you are looking at a small thing there. Why do you worry about those small things? Just look at the big picture. When I joined <coughs> my first employer, the owner of the company, Mr. A.F. Jones, will be, Meryl, one advice I can give you in life is, Look after your pennies. The pounds will look after themselves. It's an old adage, but it works. Yeah. That is what guides me today. Nothing is too small for me. Nothing is too big for me. And I am one man. All my staff know I will never accept the existing system or the establishment. I want to change it. And I have successfully changed in many areas. For example, government comes up with rules and regulations which are framed by people, by public officials who know nothing about the business. So it is our duty to go and tell them this shouldn't be the way it is, it should be this way. Nobody goes. So, and we complain about the government, they have done this, they have messed it up. And that. I never complain. I go to the government and explain these are the things, so and so. An alternative. Yes, and they have always very kindly accepted my position and thanked me. And everybody in the trade benefits from that. But we do not have the courage of our convictions that if this is the wrong thing, we should not accept it. Most of our Sri Lankans complain and say that is wrong, that is wrong, why is the government doing this or somebody else doing that. But do a little about it. Do nothing about it. But in more, as I said, if I am asked to implement government regulations, I will never attempt. I said I don't know about it. But officials, whether they, they know or not, are forced to introduce regulation guidelines. If they are wrong, we had to point out. But we don't. And if we do, they will listen. It's a way forward, certainly. Yes, and because I have, even today, I do not accept the old systems. Even my various departments, I tell them, I say, you are now working on an old colonial system. 150 years old, we have to change. They are against it. But when I change, ah, that's it. So this is it. So you demand change. I'm always a man for change. I never, never accept the established systems if they are wrong, if, if in my mind they are wrong. Unless we do we have people like that, we can't grow. If we, if we achieve something, everybody benefits. But our people are not used to challenging, not used to changing. They accept and grumble. But so you have trailblazed the whole story. You have changed <laughs> the world in, in more ways than one. And as you have always believed in yes. change, oh, yes. you are still fighting change. Everything. No. And everything you have done yes. has been to care and to share and yes. change the world as oh, we know it. Oh, yeah. What can I do? Do you think I can take this money when I go? I have been very conscious of the fact. My humble beginnings, the values my parents taught me are my greatest strengths in the growth of my business life and whatever I do. If we forget our beginnings and forget our values, we lose our way. I always am very proud to say, 
I came from there. I am here because the foundation given to me by my parents is very solid. I can never forget. Brilliant story, sir. On that note, it's been an inspiration and I think you have now changed the world for Sri Lanka. <laughs> thank and you. For thank Salon you. Tea. And the brand label <laughs> Dilma is now just the word is Dilma as is. The world knows it for you and your face on that packet has also changed a lot of things. Your caring and sharing policy has inspired all of us and it's been a privilege and an honor to have spent the time with you, sir. You. And may I make a final comment? You may, sir. I was only the messenger of Ceylon tea. Ceylon tea had a global reputation as being the finest quality. I took that quality to consumers around the world at the right price with benefits to my country, benefits to me, which I am sharing with the poor. So I get all the credit. Or 95% of the credit must go to Ceylon tea. Fabulous, sir, on that note. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Sir. On Game Changers, there you have it. The man, the vision, the strength, the trailblaze. All about his brand and how he persisted from his origins and the lessons learned from his mother and the way he's carried that forward. Ceylon Tea and the brand Ceylon remains a strength. And Mary J. Fernando, we hope, stronger in the future.